so here we are, the last presentation of the day, the wealth part of your afternoon. Just to recap real quick, we did hear from some great presenters this afternoon. Thank all of you for coming out, by the way. Uh, we heard from Katie about how, as, as marketers and business owners, we need to get ourselves out there, attract attention to ourselves, say and do the right things to grow our business. Um, from the lovely group of ladies that did our health presentation, we learned about uh, proper ways to carry ourselves, to take care of ourselves physically, what we should eat to take care of ourselves from the inside, essential oils, ways that we can relax our mind. All of those things are things that we do to help keep ourselves stress-free, productive, moving forward, and overall just best practices in how to care for ourselves. Another best practice in how to care for yourself is to make sure that you're not just taking care of yourself physically and emotionally, but that you're taking care of yourself financially. So we're gonna spend the next few minutes talking about how, as women, those challenges are a little bit different for us and some of the things we can do to overcome them. So real quick, my name is Jennifer Polidori. For those of you that haven't already met, I am a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch. My office is in Paramus. I have been with the firm for about 14 years. Um, my 14 year run with the company was interrupted for about eight years where I had left in 2000, 2001. My daughter was about one years old um, and I wanted to start a restaurant and catering company. So in 2001, I did go into business for myself, uh, which lasted about five or six years. And then in 2008, after the birth of my son, I did return to Merrill Lynch. Um, and a few years after that, I made the decision to go on, go into business for myself within the firm. So I had gone back in 2008 in, in administrative capacity. And then a few years later, decided to start my own practice and build my own book. So what that says, that whole brief description of my path, is that throughout my journey, I have taken some interruptions and gone through some radical career changes, which in itself presents one of the greatest challenges that women face when preparing for their retirement. So if I were just to ask you quickly around the room, if I ask you when thinking about, and now we have a very diverse group of women, some of you I'm sure have children, don't have children, have children that are still young, have children that are in college, out of college, there's a, a, a range of ages in this room. Some of you may be employed by a firm. Some of you may be business owners. So when you think about your own personal situation, when I ask you, when you think about preparing for your own individual retirement, what are some of those challenges that you think present that you, are you're being presented with in your own life? Anyone have an idea of what a challenge for a woman preparing for retirement would be? Any guesses? Saving Any? enough money. Saving enough money. Okay. Um, Caregiving of others. Caregiving of others, right. So those actually are any other guesses? Running out of money. Running out of money, <laughs> running out of money. Um, and those are all good guesses and each one of them will tie into, we're gonna actually specifically address three challenges today. The first one being healthcare and longevity. The second one being caregiving, inconsistent work patterns. And the third one being the gender difference between men and women and, and the lack of confidence in investing that most women tend to feel. So if we look at the first one, we talk about healthcare and longevity. Um, Karen had mentioned care, I'm sorry, someone had mentioned running out of money. So what that means is that for women, healthcare, for men and women, healthcare is on the rise, but for women more so, we tend to statistically in later years in life, spend more on our own individual healthcare than men do. And we are living longer. Um, they say that according to a study by Social Security, a woman the age of 65 now can expect to live another 21.6 years versus a man uh, estimated to live another 19.3 years. So most of that time will be spent in retirement. 25 to 30 years is the average span of retirement now that a woman can expect. Um, and that's you know filled with activities, journeys, not just healthcare expenses, but we do a lot of things and those things cost money. So when we think about the rising care cost of healthcare, and we compare that to longevity, that now means that we're living longer, so we're paying those healthcare costs longer. Um, they say that 70% of both men and women over the age of 65, at some point after that, after 65, will require some type of a long-term healthcare. Mm -hmm. Now your long-term healthcare is um, in or outpatient, skilled nursing facility, private room in a nursing home, a home health aid, something, something of that nature, those costs are not covered by Medicare or your private health insurance. So 
we look at that and think that usually a long-term care benefit is tapped into for about two or three years. That can run a little bit longer for women because we are using the, we're living longer, so we're using those benefits longer. Um, if you just look at the top corner, and by the way, this was awesome while I was setting this up. I've never written on a wall before, yeah. so I kind of feel like a real teacher today. I was getting my, my work ready. So the first um, list of, of numbers that we have here is just, and this is a based off of a 2013 survey, so this number has actually gone up, and this is also the average across the country. We uh, live in the state of New Jersey, which is one of the most prohibitive healthcare cost states mm -hmm. in the country. So you can imagine that just for us alone, that number is already higher. Um, if you're looking at home health aid, we're looking at about $45,000 a year, and these are annual costs. Um, assisted living residents, 42,000. Nursing home semi-private versus a nursing home prior room, somewhere between 77 and 87,000. I'm gonna say that in New Jersey now in 2016, that bottom number is probably closer to uh, north of 90,000, closer to $100,000 a year. So how do you pay for that? Most people just assume that they will have saved enough or that they will just cover those costs out of pocket. So what that means is that when you incur an expense like that, any money that you have saved for your day-to-day -day living, for the activities, for the dreams that you hope to fulfill in your retirement, are now coming out of your pocket and paying your healthcare costs. What does that do in, uh, what does that do to a woman that's on her own? Or what does that do to a, a marital situation where one of the partners is requiring that type of healthcare cost and the money that's been saved for the joint retirement is now being depleted that significantly, it eventually will affect the lifestyle of the other partner. Um, so as we get to the end of this, we'll, we'll touch back on that again and talk about some of the ways that we can overcome some of those challenges. And then we're gonna go into the next challenge. And Karen had mentioned caregiving is one of the challenges that women face when they save for their retirement and inconsistent work patterns, they go hand in hand. Caregiving is one of probably the largest challenges that women face. And just to circle back to my intro, just to myself alone, I had left my business with my firm, my, my employment with my firm in 2001 when my daughter was one. I had spent a year looking for the restaurant before we secured the lo location and I was taking care of her when she was a baby. From 2001 until I returned to Merrill Lynch, I was working privately for myself, paying healthcare costs out of pocket, and not contributing to any type of a retirement plan whatsoever. It wasn't until I returned to Merrill Lynch that I started to participate in the employer-sponsored plan again and alleviated some of those out-of-pocket costs that we were paying for family health care. My situation was a choice that I had made when my daughter was little. There are situations that arise for women where we are in a particularly place, and, and I can say, most of the women in this room are in that sweet spot where we now have children in their 30s that are returning home. And I, I actually heard a few of the women talking about it now, older children that are done with college that are moving home. We're picking up the cost for that again and we're starting to care for our children. We have children that are giving birth to our first grandchildren and uh, require our help. So we're pumping the brakes on, and for those of you that are self-employed and running your own business, maybe you're pumping the brakes a little bit on your productivity and your marketing because now you're spending more time at home with your daughter with that baby that she's just brought into your family and that's where you wanna be. But if you're not at work and you're not consistently saving, you're not building that retirement nest egg. Um, on the other side of that, we're also at that age now where we have parents that are starting to age and require our help. We have parents that may, um, one of the spouse, our mother or our father may be entering some type of a nursing home and now our mom is home alone. Maybe they need to come live with you or you need to spend more time out of your home helping them. Either way, we take on that responsibility of playing that caregiver role. Um, and statistically, they say that across the United States, 60% of individuals that assume the role of caregiver are women. Um, and then just to break that down a little more for those of you that have children, out of approximately 12 million single parent households in this country, 80% of those households are, the, the woman is the head of the household. So whichever dynamic you're looking at it from, either way, where, where your costs, where the cost burden is higher on caring for the children, paying for those out of care medical bills, uh, not putting money into retirement because those dollars are going toward day-to-day -to -day living, especially when you step back a little bit. Sometimes it even creates a situation where you're not just not saving because you're using that income for day-to-day, -day, but you're also starting to draw down on it. 
Um, so that's definitely something that affects us across the board as caregivers. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an example of what that looks like for women that off-ramp or take time off from their career. Uh, even if it's a um, situation where you're taking the scenic route where instead of actively pursuing that promotion, maybe expanding into that second location or doing whatever the next step would be to really bring your business to the next level, you dialed it down a little bit because you assumed a caregiving role. So if we look at Susan and Bob, Susan and Bob both start working at age 25. They work until age 65. Susan and Bob both start putting $3,000 a year away in their retirement account between the ages of 25 and 30. At age 31, Susan, for whatever reason it is, she, she's assumed some type of a caregiving role and from 31 to 45, she is no longer employed. She's, whether she's uh, in a marriage and, and her husband's working, whatever the situation is, she's no longer annually contributing to any type of retirement account. Bob continues to increase his on a steady basis. So now from the ages of 31 to 45, Bob is putting away $4,000. At age 46, Susan re-enters the workforce and starts to increase her annual contribution to $4,000, but she's still lacking Bob because now he's increasing his to $5,000. From 51 to 65, 5,000 and $6,000 get put away, okay? So over the course of those 40 years, Susan out of pocket has put away $113,000. Bob has put away $193,000. This period of time that Susan stepped away from, from the work Force and, and no longer contributed to her retirement results in a difference of 262,000 some odd dollars. With a 5% estimated annual rate of return, her dollars have turned into 266 some odd thousand dollars, while his has grown to 528. That's almost 50% less than what Bob has put away in retirement. And they say statistically that three or more years out of the, out of the workforce can affect your earnings, your earning power by 50%. And you can see that illustrated in that example right there. Um, so now Susan and Bob will retire. You can see that Bob is obviously in a much more comfortable position for retirement. Which brings us to the third challenge that we face when we are thinking about the differences for women in preparing for retirement. And that would be not only the gender difference, and we're just gonna talk about that first because it ties in, but also lack of confidence. So, if I were to say to you, I know less than the average investor about financial markets and investing in general. Raise your hand if that statement applies to you. I know less than the average investor about financial markets and investing in general. Statistically, when asked that question across an equal sample of men and women, only 25% of men agree with that statement, where more than 50% of women agree with that statement. So your, your lack of confidence in the investment markets, the investment choices, how, how the markets work, what's out there, what's available, because of that lack of knowledge or lack of confidence, that directly affects the savings vehicles that you choose even when you are in a situation where you're putting those dollars away. Um, also, another, another statistic, which I'm sure, unfortunately, still today will not surprise most of you, is that on average, women earn less over time than their male counterparts. Uh, and that's not only due to lower wages, but it's also due to less earning years. So when you're talking about an earning year perspective, over the lifetime, it can create a shortfall of approximately $300,000, which we see here, close to $300,000, which equivalents to 79 cents on the dollar. So we're actually saving a, an overall retirement accumulation of 79 cents versus men that are saving a dollar toward retirement. So there's a big difference there, um, which creates a situation where the, the median retirement income of women is 58%, 58, so anywhere between 50 and 60% um, of a difference between what men are able to earn over the course of their working year. When you have the ability to save that money, regardless of what your shortfall is, whatever it is that you've accumulated, what is it that you do with it when it's put away? How are you saving the money? And that's where we revert back to the third challenge that women face where we're talking about a lack of confidence. Women tend to, without the guidance of a professional, um, or if it is the role in the marriage that they assume to make the investment decisions, women tend to, and I see this all of the time, tend to be much more conservative in their investment choices, regardless of where they land on the investment 
time horizon, whether it's very early on in their career or later in their career. There's no real difference in, in many women investors' mindset as to what those investments should look like in the beginning when they should be more growth oriented toward the end of the spectrum when they should start to think on more of a fixed income perspective. Uh, for women, that, that's almost the same across the board, conservative all the way. That affects the growth rate of whatever it is that you have chosen to use as your investment vehicle for the dollars that you put aside. Each one of these comparisons is looking at um, an average rate of return, an estimated average annual rate of return of about 5%. That's a pretty fair mark to land, especially where we're at in the markets right now. You know, fixed income securities are paying a little lower, but in a fully diversified portfolio, that's a, that's a fair um, number to use. If you're not fully diversified, if you're not participating in, in all of the market that has to offer, if you're just gearing it toward cash or CDs or bonds or those things that you deem to be safe, you're not reaching that number um, across your, your investment time horizon. So the, the way to look at that is that you need to make sure that you have enough knowledge to be a little more confident in making decisions that are more suitable for you. And for everyone in this room, I can tell you right now that answer is completely different completely different because some of you have more time toward retirement, some of you have less time toward retirement, some of you are higher earners, some of you are not dependent on that income. So wherever your time horizon and your risk tolerance and that need for that liquidity are is what's going to determine what your asset allocation should look like. And that's something that if I, if I were to tell you that's what you need to think about. Most people on average don't even know what that means. So they just take that money and they look at the mutual fund offerings that come in their 401k, they pick whatever they think looks conservative and they set it and forget it. Now, like anything else, that's a constantly evolving process. So it's something that needs to be monitored and worked on and tweaked as your investment needs change throughout the year to make sure that whatever the number is at the end, you've worked very, very hard to put it away. So you wanna make sure that it's working equally as hard to take care of you when you're ready to step back and live off of that. Um, so, what are some of the solutions that we can offer you or advice that we can give you for any one of these three challenges? And before I go on, is everyone, does anyone have any questions? Is there any, everyone's good? All right, so if we talk about strategies for overcoming some of the challenges, we'll go back to our challenges first. And we think about healthcare and longevity. So the first two things that come to mind, I have two things specifically that, that pop out into my mind when I think of the challenge of healthcare costs and, and making my dollar stretch longer through longevity. Anyone have any idea what some of the things we can do to overcome for healthcare costs, preparing for healthcare costs in retirement, making those dollars stretch a little bit longer in retirement? Anyone currently working on with an advisor now? Long-term care, long-term care is huge, huge. And it's come a long way since its inception in the market. And it was probably, um, a product that really started to make itself known back in the early 2000s. A lot of those original contracts that were issued, there have been problems with them throughout the years as far as ri uh, rising cost of premiums because the market really didn't factor out how, what that need was actually going to be, how great it was going to be. So we have people that have paid into those contracts for years and years and years and are now looking to actually draw down on that benefit. And because there's been an adjustment in what that premium should look like, they're either paying a, a much higher premium or they're taking a reduction in the benefit. So what the industry did was to create throughout the last, I would say 10 or so years, um, some hybrid products that are out there now that are phenomenal. And they offer um, something which is close to three to one, long, to long-term care dollars for every dollar that you put in. So long-term care, and, and you know, I could spend an hour talking to you just about long-term care, but just to keep it high level, there are a lot of products out there now that are um, very different and very user-friendly, very easy to understand and very transparent. I can essentially take that money, especially if you've already earmarked dollars for it. If you set aside a certain amount of money, this is my money in case something happens and I get sick. Now you can take that money and put it in a product that can turn each one of those dollars into three to one for a long-term care. So there are a lot of products out there. If that's the point that you're at in your investment savings plan where you need to start thinking about that, that can help carve out a security blanket for what's gonna pay for that long-term care need if you need to go into a nursing home for a year because most of us don't have a hundred thousand dollars to just tap into and pay for a year in a nursing home without significantly wiping out or changing our quality of life um, and you know and not to go into a big medicaid thing medicaid will cover long-term care benefits but we all know what we have to do in order to qualify for medicaid and 
that's the least attractive option to anyone. That's not, that's not why we're working. We're not working to give it all back so that we can have someone take care of us. Um, longevity, when we think about longevity, we think about wanting to make sure that for those, what they now say is 25 to 30 years of, of dollars that we need to spend to cover our retirement, how do we offset what we're gonna get in social security? How do we offset what our dollar on our 401k or those of you that may still have a pension, whatever it is that that money is that you know is gonna to come to you in retirement. How do we offset that? How do we fill the gap in what that dollar amount looks like versus what we would like it to be? Um, there's products out there like annuities and not to go too deep of a dive in an annuity, but you can um, invest your money in a tax deferred saving vehicle now that can guarantee you what that stream of income is going to look like when you turn it on in retirement. So now you've isolated another portion of that money and you've created a situation where you know when you turn 70 and a half and you start drawing down on that, it's gonna be X amount of dollars. So you put that on the list of, now I know I'm getting this from Social Security, I know I'm gonna get this from my 401k, and I have an annuity that when I need to turn on that income is gonna pay this. So those are some of the strategies that you can also explore. Um, caregiving and inconsistent work habits. As far as caregiving goes, you know, depending on what your situation is, there really isn't the right answer for that. Whether you say no, whether you say yes, we never say no. We never say no to our children, we never say no to our parents. Everything falls on our shoulders. I've seen families who have come to me where there's a brother and a sister and the mother needs something and it's not even a discussion. The whole entire family just assumes that the, that the woman in that the, of the children is going to take that responsibility on. So other than telling you that not from a financial perspective, but just from a human perspective, if you're in a situation where you need to make a decision as to who's going to be the caregiver, if you're in a situation where you're a part of a marriage, um, it should be a conversation that should be had as to how we're going to overcome for that loss of income. For some women, it could be a situation where if it's applicable to you, um, if your husband is employed and you are taking time off of work, maybe you need to create some type of a spousal IRA so that a contribution is still being made for you so that you can still continue to build that nest egg. Um, inconsistent work. So we talk about that off-ramping or that dialing back on our career and inconsistent work patterns. The one thing I'll tell you is that when you're not working and you're not contributing, you're not saving. So that's the biggest downfall of having an inconsistent work pattern. My example in particular, those years that I was away, I did not put dollar one toward any of my retirement accounts. I could have started some type of a SEP. I could have um, continued to contribute to a regular IRA. I could have done things, but it's not always an option. I didn't, hindsight is, you know, 2020. But just to give you one more example, of uh, saving early and saving consistently to help block out some of the, the trouble that we feel when we have that inconsistent work pattern. If we take the example of Amy, Mary, and Kay. Amy starts saving at 25, Mary starts saving at 35, Kay starts saving at 45. Again, that estimated annual rate of return is about 5%. Putting away $250 a month. Over the course of their life, Amy will have saved $383,000 starting at age 25 versus Kay, who's saved $107,000 some odd dollars starting at age 45. So your biggest defense against feeling the difference in what that number looks like is no matter what it is, however little it is, start as early as you can. So for the younger ladies in this room, if you are a part of a company that's offering you some type of an employer-sponsored plan where there is a match, whatever that match is, if you can do it, if you can afford to do it, Take advantage of it because it's found money. And if you start early and you start building that nest egg early, if you end up in a situation where you have to step away for a little while, at least there's something there. What's there? Make sure that you invest it wisely and that you revisit and check it regularly. You should be checking on your investments depending on what you're looking at. Your 401k you should look at at least annually. Um, if you're working with an advisor and have a portfolio, that person should be reaching out and sitting down with you a minimum of twice a year. Uh, especially with what we've been seeing in the last couple of years with the volatility and it seems like everything is is weighing into the market and we have a lot of things coming up right now that are going to create some volatility you should always be checking into that that's another guardrail you can put up um, against protecting what it is that you save making sure that you're monitoring it another strategy that you can use to overcome for inconsistent work patterns is uh, how you play social security so and not to go too deep in social security there have been some changes in the legislation over the last year or two years but you have the option to start taking Social Security at age 62. Uh, 62. The maximum age that you can take your benefit is age 70. For probably everyone in this room, your full retirement age is 66. 
So if you were to have a full retirement benefit that was, and to use a round number, $1,000, if you started taking that benefit at age 62, it would reduce that benefit to $750. If you were able to utilize the other strategies and other investments that you have in place or work longer, which is an option for, for a lot of people to continue working longer, um, you can stretch that out to age 70, which would give you a benefit of $1,320. So there's some area in there, and that's something you should always be weighing in and taking into consideration when you're looking at where your other sources of income are going to come from when you start taking Social Security. Um, so that's definitely something we can have a conversation with offline. But the only other thing I can say to you is, in addition to starting early and being diligent and making sure you take care of yourself when it comes to this, make sure that if you are an employer, that you're using whatever employer-sponsored plans are out there. And if, I'm sorry, if you're an employee, if you're an employer, make sure that you understand as an employer what types of retirement plans are out there that you can put in place for yourself. And um, the employer plans tend to have a little bit more uh, flexibility as far as the dollars that you can put away. And there's also tax benefits for your company. So you should be sitting down with someone and thinking about what type of plan is right for your business. It's also attractive to employees. So mm -hmm. from from an employer perspective, having a, a retirement plan or some type of a package helps you retain those employees that are sometimes hard to get. So there's a million things that we can talk about and we can deep dive into any one of these. The, I guess the, the thing I would like to leave and impress upon you the most is that make sure you're working with someone that understands what you have. Make sure you understand what you have. Make sure you understand the options that are out there. Make sure that you revisit it regularly. Um, for some of us, that might mean taking a little more risk than we already have. You'd be surprised at what kind of working room you have within a portfolio uh, that hasn't been looked at in a few years. But reaching out to someone that can sit down and act as an expert on your behalf and put this all into a formula that will show you 20 years from now exactly what that dollar amount you know, will look like based on certain types of returns so that you're better armed, so that you know where, where you're going to be. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's what I have to talk to you about as far as challenges and ways that we can work around them. Does anyone have any questions? This should be a course in college. Yeah. It should be. 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 For each one of these yeah. subjects, we could probably spend an hour just yeah. talking. I mean, like, I tried to keep it as high level as I could, but there's just so much here that, you know, Everyone should at least have a little little piece of knowledge yeah. in, in what they're doing. And actually, a big part of my practice now that I'm carving out is specifically working with women that have money in transition, women that are either um, the CEOs of their household, so that th those financial decisions land on their shoulders, that's their role, mm -hmm. or women that are either um, have unfortunately lost a spouse or are going through a divorce, mm -hmm. and that was never their role. So they come to me, and I've had women that have just recently um, gone through a divorce and they come to me with boxes of yeah. bills, statements, paperwork, things that are old or old 401ks, that companies they don't work with anymore and they just say, I, you know, I never even knew what we had. I have no idea what to do with any of this. Um, and that's a shame when you see that, you know, especially from for a woman to a woman, mm -hmm. I, everyone should know what they have. You mm -hmm. should all know what you're working with. So yeah, I have a question. What if you have a job that doesn't offer any type of financial help? Um, savings. What would you recommend to someone to get started if their job doesn't offer it? Would you recommend an IRA or, you know, to a young person? A, a traditional IRA. An IRA would be the best. They tend to have the lower um, amounts that you can put away. They max out at a lower amount, but it's, you know, if for a younger person, the likelihood of them maxing out at that anyway yeah. uh -huh. is, well, is not likely. So as long as they're putting away something. Yeah. Um, you know, and even if you're not, even as a younger person, even if you're not putting money in a retirement account, put money in your savings account, put money somewhere, just put money in something that you know, just to start the discipline process and just to get that, that process in place that I'm going to put X amount of dollars away every month. Yeah. Um, especially if you're in a situation where you foresee that there is a chance in the future that you'll need to tap into that money. If you start putting those dollars away in a retirement account and you need to go back into it, uh, you're penalized for it. So if you feel like it's not liquid, if, that it's going to be money that you're going to need, at least just put it in a savings account so that you're not penalized for an early withdrawal. But just create that discipline within yourself that you're going to pay yourself first. You're going to put the money away every month, whatever it is. 
Um, so that's it. So I want to thank all of you for coming out. I hope that you learned a little bit about 